We're going to do a special one-of-a-kind project today. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today I've got a special one-of-a-kind project that is pretty unique and is going to be pretty fun and I will tell you the whole story of it as we are turning the bowl. But we're going to start off with this little chunk of quarter sawn mulberry. It's beautiful tight wood grain is going to yield a beautiful small bowl. Now this was cut off from a larger piece and I'm hoping that this turning today will help you see what you can do with these little scraps of wood and what cool things can be turned from them. I'm going to get this mounted to the lathe and we're going to get started. Okay, so when we're making a blank this small, it's nice to use the circle template. This gives us a really good idea where we're going to be cutting, and I don't really want that lighter sapwood to show, so I've picked a circle that fits in there. I'm going to mark the center of that. And I'm going to do the same on both sides. I do not want to run this through the bandsaw because it's so small, I really don't have the clearance for my fingers to safely guide this piece, and we'll be able to round it out pretty quickly on the lathe. So I'll mark those centers, and then I'm going to mount it between centers. I'm going to use a four spur drive center and the tailstock. You can see the wood grain there on this quarter sawn wood, how it's all lined up. We're looking at in grain right there. Inside in, so that's how you know it's a side mounted bull blank. Now, if you notice there, I moved the controls for the lathe over to the side where I'm turning. If you have that ability with your lathe, that's a great option because it gives you the ability to not have to reach across your turning to turn off the lathe if you have to. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to keep tightening the tail stock, so I'm kind of reaching across my turning here. So we're just going to go with it. I'm getting the speed of the piece up a bit. And as this gets set in the drive center, it's going to start slipping because it's, it's going to work itself loose. So I'm going to continually tighten up the tailstock. And I'm going to lighten up my passes. So I, instead of taking a deeper cut, I'm going to take a lighter cut or a lighter pass and just shave off a little bit each time. You can see here I'm using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge and I'm pointing the nose of the gouge in the direction of the cut. In this case I'm moving left to right. Something worth mentioning here as far as the supported grain cut. Because we're moving straight across the edge at 90 degrees to the end grain, we can actually move left to right or right to left and we're cutting those end grain fibers pretty much the same from either direction. It's when we start getting into the curve of the exterior of the bowl or the curve on the inside of the bowl when we really need to be concerned with the supported grain direction of the cut. So in this case I'm moving left to right and I have the nose of the bowl gouge or the flute turned in the direction of the cut. I have it positioned to the right because I'm moving to the right. All right, so the blank is starting to take shape. I'm going to keep moving the tool rest up as I go so that I've got good support right next to the turning. I don't want the tool rest right on top of the turning, but close enough that it's supporting the front end of the bowl gouge. And I'll keep making passes. And light, just making light, thin cuts each time. Now, if I get really aggressive here, we've already seen that it's going to stop the turning. And basically that drive center in the Morris taper is going to spin or it's going to spin on the front end of the blank and bore out a hole in there. So we don't want to get too aggressive here. We're just going to shave off a little bit until we get down to the cylinder that we're looking for. There you can see I have the gouge rotated to the right at about a 45 degree angle. You can see how just the front right edge of the gouge is actually engaged. 
We're getting pretty close there. I'm going to take that down just a little bit. I'm trying to get down to a nice clean cylinder to, to work with without wasting too much material. All right, that's looking pretty good. I can feel that it's nice and smooth as it's making the cut. And that's looking really good. We'll remove more material as we're curving up the sides. So I'm going to flatten the face of this. I just want to clean it up a little bit. It's almost flush right now. I just want to make sure it's good and level. So I'm going to make a push cut across that surface and we'll get it ready for the tendon and shoulders. If you recall, I made some shelves in my barn to store wood. And in that video, I shared with you my golf cart workhorse vehicle that I use that I got, I bought used and it is fantastic for driving around bull blanks and heavy things and that. And I've been using it a lot more than I imagined I'd be using it. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, there was a Carolina Wren that decided to make a nest in one of the the little storage compartments in that cart. And it abandoned the nest. I came out and I found it there. And unfortunately, the mother was not tending to the eggs. So the eggs did not incubate or hatch. I checked the length of the incubation time and I gave it plenty of time and space thinking maybe she'll come back and that, but she didn't. So I have this really cool nest in my, I call it, I call it Carrie. I give it a name Carrie. It's, <laughs> I named her Carrie is the name of my carry all golf cart because it's called a carry all. So I'm calling it carry because it carries everything for me. So I found this nest in carry and I just thought how cool this was. It's just so neat to, first of all, the eggs are super neat because they are speckled and very unique. And then the way the nest is built, there's so many different things in here, so many different materials that he used. So I can't really keep this great big nest around. So what I decided to do is I'm going to make this into a little nest bowl that I can display these eggs in. And I wanted to kind of mimic an actual nest. I want it to look organic and I want it to have a, a secure feeling to it. So one of the things I'm going to do with this bowl is I'm going to make it a closed rim bowl. I'm going to make it so that the top rim is narrower than the apex right here. This is going to be, that's going to be the highest point of the outside of the bowl. So I'm using a scraping cut here up on the rim and I'm going to use that to establish where the rim is going to start. That levels off the uneven material there. And then I'm going to make a push cut from the rim up to that apex. Now, if you saw my supported grain video, you know exactly why I'm, I changed directions here. I'm moving in the direction that is a supported grain cut. That means that underneath the ingrain fibers in the direction I'm cutting, there are longer fibers that are supporting the ones being cut. So if you haven't seen that video, you're going to want to check it out. It's all about supported grain cut. And if you're having any kind of issues with inconsistent surface smoothness when you're done turning, there's a chance that you may be turning some supported grain cuts and some unsupported grain cuts. And this video is going to help you understand that. So you really want to check that out. So back to this bowl, we're going to have a closed rim, meaning the rim is going to be narrower than the apex of the bowl. Here you can see I'm cleaning up that little high spot on the apex or the highest point on the exterior of this bowl with a shear scrape. The shear scrape is a little bit tricky on a small piece like this because it's it's not as easy to to get the tool to engage. I'm using the lower wing of the gouge with the flute facing the bowl and it's a it's a scraping cut but because I'm dropping the handle that makes it a shear scraping cut which means I'm just shaving off a very light area to refine the surface and make it smooth. 
I'm going to take the shoulder down just a little bit and shape the bottom of this. And again, I'm going to use the shear scrape here to clean up that area and smooth out the curve. Shear scrape is the technique to smooth out a, a surface that's almost to the shape you want, but it's not consistent or there's imperfections in it and you want to smooth it out just a little bit. That's when you really want to use the shear scrape. And I've got a video all about the shear scrape. You definitely want to check that out. Okay, so the exterior of the bowl is looking pretty good. Look at the grains. See how the quarter sawn wood is stacked up all those grains? And then on the ends of that, because we're looking at the stacked layers of grain lines, there's kind of like the little bullseyes on the end. That's another thing, another feature I really like about turning quarter sawn wood. So I'm going to sand this up because most of the exterior is well exposed here. I'm probably not going to be able to get to the base of this quite as well with the bowl in the four jaw chuck. So I'm going to go ahead and sand this down through all the grits right now so it's nice and smooth. And I'm just working the edge of the sander. And I have my respirator on at all times. You can see the dust in the air here. If you're sensing that you're breathing dust, if you're sneezing or coughing, if you're tasting wood, you're breathing dust and you really don't want to do that because you can do it for a while without any problems, but the very fine dust builds up over time until it becomes an issue and you may have health problems from it. So just turn on the safe side, wear a respirator at all times. That way you're not breathing in these dust particles and you're not letting them build up. And one of the great tests is, do you smell it or do you taste it? And if you, if your respirator is working well and the wood you're turning has an odor or a taste, if you're tasting it in the air, if you take your respirator off for a moment, that should immediately be present. Meaning when you're turning, you're not sensing any of that with the respirator on. But when you take a break and you pop that respirator off, you might smell those dust particles in the air right away. That's a good indication that your respirator is working well. And I've got a full face fitting or a full mouth and nose covering respirator, which is, is equally as important. I may do a video on that in the near future. Okay, so I've turned this around. By the way, I'm doing this entire bowl with my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. There's no need for any other gouge. It's just such a small piece. There's no reason to get my 5 8 inch or my 3 quarter inch, which would be way too big. And actually a smaller piece like this, a smaller gouge like a 3 8 inch or even possibly a quarter inch could be beneficial, but the half inch bowl gouge is very versatile for a piece this size. I'm using the same te techniques I use all the time. I'm just working down the inside of this bowl to establish the wall thickness. Now I'm doing something a little different here. I'm using a very light scraping cut on the rim to round off the rim corners. I want this to appear more organic. I like, I like crisp rim edges most of the time, but for something like this, I, I want it to be a little more organic and natural feeling. So I'm going to round those over a bit. Now that rounding process can also be done when you're sanding at the end, but I found if you start it a bit with scraping that you can, you can really fine tune the shape exactly the way you'd like and then clean it up with the sandpaper. So I'm using push cuts. Now the other thing, I've got a small tenon on this, so I want to be delicate with these cuts. I really want to make sure my bowl gouge is sharp and I want to take very light cuts at each time. And then the way I'm clearing the middle of this, I'm using push cuts, which go into the headstock, which produce less force against the jaws of the four jaw chuck. If I'm doing a cut that's perpendicular to the jaws, that's when I really have to make sure I'm 
not forcing it and I'm applying just light pressure and letting the tool cut and giving it time to cut. If I get a catch when I'm going perpendicular to the headstock, there's a good chance this piece could get thrown up, uh, out of the four jaw chuck or the tenon can break. We don't want that. And here's another feature of a closed rim bowl is the shavings will stay inside the bowl no matter what. <laughs> so you have to stop periodically and scoop those out. So I'm establishing the wall thickness from the rim down and just taking my time and maintaining that thickness as I go down and then clearing away the material in the center. It's feeling pretty good. I just love the, the graphic nature of a quarter sawn bowl. You can see all those grain lines and the patterns that they create. And this mulberry is just a beautiful wood. It has a kind of a golden yellow color to it. It also has medullary rays. There are grain lines that run opposite or opposed to the grain lines, the main growth rings of the tree. They actually grow from the pith of the tree out towards the bark. So if you look close at this piece, you can actually see those. And that makes it shimmer and gives it reflective qualities in light. It's also called chatoyance. It's basically a big fancy French name for shiny, sparkly, cool looking things. <laughs> I don't think that's quite the definition, but it's close to that. So I'm just making light cuts. I'm rubbing the bevel and feeling where my previous cut was and then picking up that cut and it's looking really good here. I just want to show you guys something here. This is why I love the 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. I did not have to change gouges at all. The bevel makes contact inside this bowl the entire time I'm turning. So if you look, I can reach here obviously, but I can reach all the way down to the bottom center of this and the shaft of the bowl gouge is not hitting the rim. There's plenty of room there. It's one of the reasons I love the 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge is I don't have to change tools and it's very versatile. I can get into all sorts of areas with it very conveniently. All right, I'm going to sand the interior of this and I'll sand through all the grits of this and I'm rounding off that rim to make it nice and natural feeling. Okay, so now I need to work the tailstock or I need to work the bottom of the bowl rather and I'm going to use the tailstock with that and I'm going to use my favorite method which is a custom made jam chuck. My jam chuck's a little bit larger so I'm going to switch out my four jaw chuck. Now I have a video all about jam chucks and you may want to check that out. This is just a scrap piece of wood that is shaped into a cylinder and the great thing about it is it can be modified at any point for whatever you need. In this case I'm going to create a protrusion that's going to allow us to seat this bowl onto it which is really going to hold it secure. It takes a little time and effort to get this size right. What I've found is that I taper this protruding cylinder so that it's narrow on the outside and then gets a little bit wider and that allows me to figure out where the rim is going to seat on that cylinder. So right here it's not seating all the way down but I can see where it's going to sit and then I can just lightly scrape away a small amount of material and then check it again. And this is similar to many things with wood turning. You just kind of want to sneak up on that because the thickness is very subtle. We're going to take off just a hair here using a spindle detail gouge. And we'll take a look at that and see how it fits. And it fits and it will rotate. It's not on super tight, but it's not wiggling. So I'll pull the tail stock up and now I've got great support at the rim and I have access to the tail of this bowl to finish shaping the bottom of the bowl.
Now I do have a little bit of wobble here in the tailstock. I gotta go, I've gotta address that. It didn't seem to be that big of an issue here when I was turning, but that should be turning straight without any visible wobble. So I'm gonna take the shoulder down and off. I want I want the base of this to be a little bit smaller than what I've got. So I'm gonna completely remove the shoulder. I'm using basically a push cut towards the headstock. Now I'm going to switch over to a scraping cut to transition that new cut area into the smooth side of the bowl. Just very light, delicate. I've dropped the handle a bit. This isn't quite a sheer scrape, but very close to it. There you can see the, the new foot of the bowl and the, the bottom. Now I'm going to start removing the tenon and clearing out the base of this foot. I always want the foot to have a recessed area so that there's a rim or a circle of the exterior of the foot that's contacting the table. You really don't want the bottom of a bowl to be flat. It will distort and change just a touch over time. This is relatively dry wood, so I'm not worried about it distorting too much. But even so, it can absorb moisture in the air and in, a variety of things can happen to where it will it will not stay flat forever. So it's gonna, if you have a big flat bottom, it's gonna wobble. I'm using my spindle detail gouge here to make this recessed cavity we we're talking about. And this is a half inch spindle detail gouge and it is way too big for this space. I've got a little spindle detail gouge I rarely use. I'm gonna need to go grab that. I, I think it's a quarter inch spindle detail gouge. It's very small, but it's perfect for this. There you can see how I'm scooping this out to make it a, a recessed center from the bottom of the foot. And here's the little detail gouge that I'm going, that's gonna allow me to get in there and further reduce, reduce this nub and I wanna make sure that that recessed interior has one fluid curved shape to it. All right. And now using the point of the spindle detail gouge, I'll apply forward pressure and turn the lathe off and it will sever the base of that little nub. And there's our bowl. And then I'll use sandpaper and clean up the bottom of that Wow, that's so cool. I love the way this the grains look with that. Now I'm going to use tried and true original, which is beeswax and linseed oil. This is a this is my own jar that I keep separate. I I have a larger can of this, but I put a small amount in the jar so that I don't waste or damage any of the others in the in the can. I had to take a, a little bit of time to take everything off, the, the excess off of that rag, because I only need a very little amount. Essentially, if you see the finish on the wood, you have enough. All right, so there's the finish applied. Look at those wood grains. Look at the patterns in the side of this wood. Isn't that gorgeous? I love the overall shape. Just that simple closed rim, and look what we've got here. There's the eggs on display. There's a little feather in there, too. Oh, I just love it. It's such a cool little project, and this is going to be fun to have on the shelf. Look at the grain patterns. Wow. So here it is, a wood-turned nest. It's nowhere near as cool as the nest made by the mother that laid these eggs, but it's still pretty cool to have on the shelf to be able to look at these eggs and see them up close. And wow, isn't this just spectacular? All of the little speckles on those eggs and that, and then the mulberry, the quarter sawn mulberry, it's just kind of a, a whole bowl full of nature. <laughs> Unfortunately, the eggs didn't hatch, but that's not a big deal because these guys lay a lot of eggs and they make a lot of nests and lay eggs. And unfortunately, I wonder if they just abandon their nests because they can't find them again because they make so many of them. These are the birds that will come shooting into your garage and build a nest if you leave the garage door open for more than 15 minutes. So they're pretty prolific, and I'm not super discouraged that these didn't hatch, but it's, it's kind of cool to have them on display as well and just kind of honor them and be able to look at them whenever you want. There were also really cool things in the nest. There were, 
There were little short feathers from the bird, but there were some longer feathers too, and there, were, there was shed snake skin. Now, I think the birds used the shed snake skin for a reason. I don't know if it's to ward off snakes or what, but I'll bet one of you guys out there knows the answer to that, and maybe you can leave the answer in the comments. That would be so cool. Okay, all the bird stuff aside, this is a great little project to use a scrap piece of wood, especially a quarter sawn piece of wood. Now this one has been laying around a while, so it's relatively dry. I'm not worried about this shrinking at all. This is gonna be in good shape. It's not gonna change shape hardly at all. That, that little chunk has been sitting around for many years, so I know that it's cured and dry all the way through or equalized. So I'll be able to put this on the shelf with great confidence that it's not gonna distort. So let me know what you thought of this project. Leave me a comment below. And if you haven't already, click that like button below the screen. I greatly appreciate that. It helps this video, helps the channel, and I thank you for doing that. And subscribe if you're not already subscribing. Be sure to check out my website, turnawoodbowl.com. Over there, I've got everything you're going to need to know about turning wood bowls. So check it out, turnawoodbowl.com. All right, guys, as always, until next time, thanks for watching and happy turning.